multiple human beings has their own will and their own personality and requires a ton of wisdom and grace to know how to raise them in your way. And so would you give that wisdom to each of these families? Would you pour your grace into the lives of each of these little ones? Would you grow them up to know and follow you? And would you allow us, as their church family, to do our part, to love, to pray, to care, to serve, and to come alongside these families as they seek to be faithful to your promises and to the obligations you've given them as your people? So we pray great grace upon these families and that you would strengthen them for the task. And we pray now as we turn our attention to you as our Father, that we would delight that we are a part of your family, that we are your sons and daughters. Give us great joy as we celebrate your grace and your goodness to us. In Christ's name, amen. As we begin to worship, would you, uh, if there's any empty space in your row, would you move in and leave some space open on the side so that folks coming in late can find a seat? That'd be great. Let's sing and worship the Lord together.
Good morning, church. You can clap. Hey, listen, in John chapter 1, the text upon which our sermon this morning is uh, based, one of the images it gives of Jesus is that he is the light that has shone into darkness. Now, that didn't just happen once when he was uh, in the flesh. It happens every time that we gather because we believe that Jesus Christ himself is here among us. And the light, the very nature of the light is that it reveals stuff, right? And so when you come into this house of worship, you, it ought to make you feel a little bit vulnerable and exposed that it's, it's revealing something dark in your heart. And that is why every time when we gather, because we know the light does that to the heart, we need to confess those things to the Lord, okay? So let's do that together using the words on the screen. God, we stand here this morning as sinful people. We have failed this week to love you wholeheartedly, to obey you completely, and to worship you faithfully. In your mercy, forgive our sin and fill us with your Holy Spirit that we might grow in virtue and holiness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Well, the text also says that of his fullness we have received grace upon grace, grace upon grace. So hear now God's words of pardon and peace to his people from Romans chapter 6. We were buried with Christ by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. To all who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I declare to you that you have died with Christ and you have been raised with him to new life. This is the glorious good news of the gospel. Let us rest in it and be at peace. Give life. 
church um, we talk a lot about the gospel and for us this is not just some buzzword that we like to throw around in fact if you're uh, newer to this church or newer to Christianity we don't ever want to use words um, and not define them to make you feel like an outsider we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're articulating what we mean by these words and if you're part of this church if you're a Christian we don't want you to forget what we mean when we say the gospel and so our profession of faith this morning is the answer to that question what is the gospel. The gospel is the good news that God saves sinners through the perfect life, substitutionary death, and victorious resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus, the eternal Son of God, took on flesh and died willingly in our place to deliver us from the penalty and the power of sin and bring us back to God. He rose in victory over the grave, and he will return to judge the living and the dead and to make all things new. Amen. Well, friends, it is great to be in the house of the Lord with you. Would you take a moment to greet someone in the name of the Lord this morning? Well, friends, my name is Kevin, and uh, I serve as one of the elders here. It's, uh, it's great to be here with you. I'd like to take a moment at this point in our gathering to just remind us what it is that we're trying to create here at Coram Deo Church. And we can summarize that with two words, gospel culture. Gospel culture. We don't want to be a church that merely believes gospel doctrine. We want to have a gospel culture. And you're part of that. You're part of creating that culture because every one of us plays a role in shaping and forming the culture of this church. Now, one aspect of gospel culture is safety. Safety. All of us long to be in a place where we can feel safe, where it's okay to be who we are, and where it's even okay to not be okay. Now, 
many of us um, have experienced, have not experienced the church as that kind of place. And friends, that's, that's really tragic because the gospel is good news for sinners. It's good news for sinners. In fact, the first prerequisite of coming to Jesus is to admit that you don't have it all together. I mean, we can look around this room and you can just be sure that this is a room full of people who do not have it together. But we worship a God of grace, a God of grace, who invites us to come to him, not shaped up and polished up, but as we are. And because the gospel is a message of grace, a gospel-loving church will be a place of safety and of freedom. But here's the thing. We can only experience safety as we take the risk of being known. Now, because in, in a room this size, it's a real temptation to just kind of remain anonymous. But we don't want that for any of you in this room. And so let me mention a few ways that you can get connected here at Quorum Deo Church. Uh, first, if you've not already, please sign up for our weekly email that comes out every Monday morning. Um, you can sign up right on the front page of our website. The web address is there on the screen, cdomaha.com. Secondly, if you prefer, you can text connect me to Ryan Meyer at the number that you see on the screen. And he or a member of his team will be happy to follow up with you in the next day or so to answer any questions that you have and to help you get meaningfully connected. And then third, if you'd like to, we have people that are here ready to answer questions that you have at the connection desk just to the left of these doors in the atrium on the way out. Anyone there with a green name tag is a leader or a volunteer, and they'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have or direct you to any resources that you need. You'll probably notice, too, that there's a, a bookshelf there with some common books that we like to recommend because they have some, uh, some good things to say. And so we also offer that as a resource to you. And then finally, um, you'll probably notice that we don't take an offering in our service, but instead you'll find an offering box near the doors on your way out to the left. And if you're a Christian and this is your church home, we trust that you're honoring the Lord by giving generously to his work. Well, over the next um, few weeks, for the rest of this month, I'd, I'd, I'd like to take um, each of these, this is the time, this, we call this the prayers for the people, this part of our structured service. And of course, Jesus taught us how to pray. We did a whole sermon series on the Lord's Prayer a year or two ago. He taught us how to pray. And so over the next few weeks, I'd like to pray. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together, as we always do. And then I'll zero in on one of those, uh, one of the parts of the Lord's Prayer to focus um, the prayers of the people. So let's begin praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. But we praise you, our Father, gentle and kind, compassionate and loyal, provider and protector, we praise you that all who receive Jesus, who believe in his name, have the right to become children of God. We praise you for revealing what you are like through Jesus, the word made flesh. Father, you have formed us, raised us, led us out of danger and into maturity, and have watched over us a thousand times better than any earthly father could ever dream. For each of the children who were dedicated today, empower their earthly fathers who stood on this stage to reflect the brilliant rays of your character and to do so in ways that direct the deepest affections of these little ones to you, the only true source of light and good in the world. Help us to know you as Father. What, what an outrageous and glorious reality that we can utter the words, our Father. We pray for those this morning who are here but feel abandoned or unseen, unworthy, or unloved, may they experience you as Father right now. As sons and daughters, we now carry your name. And forgive us for the ways that we have dishonored your name by our disobedience, cold-heartedness, our lack of love for one another. And instead, may your name be hallowed, honored, glorified in our lives and in the church. And Father, we ask that you would glorify your name among the nations as you are glorified 
in your son, Jesus, and among us. We ask you now, as we turn our attention to the reading of the scriptures and to the preaching of your word, that you would grant Pastor Bob a spirit of clarity and authority as he brings us the truth. And would you enlighten the eyes of our hearts to what you want to teach us from the gospel of John. In the name of Jesus, the light of the world, the word made flesh, full of grace and truth, we pray. Amen. Scripture reading for this morning is taken from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. The word of God for the people of God. Well, good morning. Um, No matter who you are, and no matter where you find yourself as you listen to this sermon this morning, you have, right now, an existing way of seeing the world, an interpretive grid through which you make sense of reality. That grid is shaped by many influences, your family of origin, your life experiences, your education, your religious convictions, perhaps most invisibly, Uh, by the cultural environment around you. But here's the question that confronts every one of us. What if the way you currently see the world isn't the way it is? What if the way you thought things are isn't the way they really are? What if something new has happened that changes everything? What if this new thing asks author Leslie Newbegin, is so radically new that it calls into question all previous axioms and assumptions, all inherited language and human experience, so that even language itself cannot serve to communicate it. What if the new thing is in fact the primal truth by which everything else has to be confronted and questioned? That is exactly what Christianity asserts, and that's exactly what the writer of the Gospel of John is facing as he introduces his book. Something has happened that's so radical that it changes everything. And the problem is, it's so foundational to everything that even language, even assumptions, even what we think is true has to be rethought in light of it. 
We begin this morning a 35-week preaching series through the Gospel of John in the New Testament. It's going to take us through Easter of next year, so you can settle in, get comfortable. We're going to be in this book for a while. And so right off the bat, let me help you understand the difference between the Gospel and the Gospels, because this can be confusing. When we talk about the Gospel, we're talking about a message. We're talking about the good news that God saves sinners through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, as we just profess in our profession of faith. The word gospel is a word that means good news, and that's the good news, that God, through Jesus, has acted in time and space and history to do something to redeem the world. That message, that news, was originally proclaimed verbally, and then it came to be written down in four eyewitness accounts. And those four accounts that we have were originally called the fourfold gospel. The gospel according to Matthew, according to Mark, according to Luke, and according to John. If you open up the New Testament, you will find those titles on the pages of the first four books. So when we talk about the gospel, we're talking about the message, the news, And when we talk about the Gospels, we're talking about the four accounts in the Bible of that news. The Gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So in this series, we're working through the Gospel according to John, the fourth book of the New Testament. Now, in the field of biblical studies, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels. You can probably clue into the fact that the word optic refers to seeing, And the Greek prefix sin means together or similar. Just think of the 90s boy band in sync and how lush their harmonies were, how just all fit together, right? The synoptic gospels are synced up. They see similarly. If Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the boy band of the New Testament, John is the indie rocker. (laughs) He's got his own vibe, he's got his own style, he's got his own lyrics. Uh, His gospel is totally distinct. The easiest way to see that difference is just to look at it. So I want to compare with you the first few verses of the gospel of Luke with the first few verses of the gospel of John. Okay, On the screen, you'll see the beginning of the gospel of Luke. Luke writes this. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile, compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word have delivered them to us, It seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Luke sounds kind of like a journalist, right? He's essentially saying, hey, some interesting things have happened among us. Folks have been writing and talking about them. I went and did the research and talked to the sources, and now I'm going to write them down for you in an orderly fashion, kind of a journalistic vibe to the Gospel of Luke. Here's the beginning of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. No introduction, no journalistic setup. It's just like you just got dropped in philosophy 301 and you're only a freshman, right? That's what just happened in the intro to the Gospel of John. So who is the author? Who is this person that's writing to us about this word of God? Well, tradition tells us the human author of the fourth gospel is John, the son of Zebedee, one of Jesus' 12 disciples. The church father Irenaeus, writing in about 200 AD, uh, tells us that he knows this personally because when Irenaeus was a young man, he was mentored by a bishop named Polycarp. And when Polycarp was a young man, he in turn was mentored by the Apostle John. Within the text itself, we keep encountering an unnamed disciple. And you'll catch this as we go through the book. Look, for example, at John chapter 20, the account of the resurrection, the empty tomb. We read this. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. He said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Most scholars think this beloved disciple, this unnamed disciple, is the author of the book. And by the way, 
Imagine having such a deep sense of Christ's love for you that you referred to yourself as the church member that Jesus loved. That's how deeply John's identity and sense of self was shaped by the love of Christ and the gospel of Jesus. Now, toward the end of the book, John gives us his purpose in writing. He tells us why he's writing this account. John 20, verses 30 and 31 says this, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's why John is writing. He's writing to convince you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He wants you to believe. That's his agenda. That's what he's out for, is to convince you to become one of Jesus' disciples, one of his followers. So, since that's the purpose of the entire book, since John is very explicit about that in writing, that's also the purpose of the message today. Here's the big idea of today's sermon. Ready? You should believe in Jesus. Man, you didn't know you were going to get that coming to church. You should believe in Jesus. And John gives us four reasons in the prologue why that's true. You should believe in Jesus because Jesus is life, because he is light, because of his glory, and because of his grace. So that's the structure of the message this morning. That's where we're headed as we look at the first 18 verses of the gospel. John, if you don't have a Bible with you, there should be one under a seat near you, and you can pull that out and open it to the gospel of John, and we are going to work our way through the prologue. You should believe in Jesus because he is life. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning. What other book of the Bible starts that way? Genesis, right? Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. John is intentionally referring back to the first verse of the Bible. In the same way that Genesis begins by telling us what happened in the beginning, John is going to tell us the story of Jesus by taking us all the way back to the beginning. John wants you to see that this Jesus is not some newcomer on the scene of world history. Rather, he is the eternal, preexistent Son of God who was in the beginning. So he begins his gospel, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything that was anything made that was made. In him was life. There's the word we want to focus in on for a few minutes. You should believe in Jesus because he is life, because in him is life. Perhaps you've seen the t-shirts or the bumper stickers or the memes that say baseball is life or hunting is life or running is life, right? Obviously hyperbole. I mean, I'm glad you like running, but it's not life. I get what you're trying to say, but it's not life, right? Contrast those kind of statements that hyperbolic statement about a hobby or something you really enjoy with statements like, oxygen is life, or food is life, or a heartbeat is life. That's a different kind of statement, right? That's the kind of statement John is making. John is saying, in Jesus is life. Jesus is not some religious figure who only matters within Christianity. Rather, he's the one who made everything that exists, the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power, Colossians chapter 1, the one without whom everything falls apart. In our modern way of thinking, we have this strange conception that um, life just is, and that religion or Jesus or Christianity is just sort of an add-on to life. Like it's an elective you can add in to your core courses, right? John is telling you that's not the case. In Jesus is life. Whatever you think living is, apart from Jesus, is not going to hold together. 
You should believe in Jesus because he is life. If you've been around here very long, you know that one of my basic pastoral strategies for preaching the gospel is just to ask, how's that working for you? Because here's what I've found to be true. All of us chase after things that we think are going to be life. You're going to take something, a career, a relationship, one of your children, some goal that you have, a political agenda. You're going to take something and you're going to try to make that the thing. And you're going to try to find life there. This is something we all do. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to find out over time that it's not going to work. Because that thing, whatever it is, does not have the power to fulfill you and to be what you expect it to be. And so, look, we got a lot of time. And part of my vision for the ministry of Quorum Dio Church is just to keep hanging around and be that voice in your ear asking, hey, so how's that working out for you? How's that thing you're seeking after working out for you? And then I get to say, we get to say, just like John does, hey, in him is life. You should believe in Jesus because he is life. He really does hold everything together. He really can sustain the weight of all your hopes and dreams and fears and longings because he is actually God. In him is life. You should believe in Jesus because he is life. Second. You should believe in Jesus because he is light. This is the shift in verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Here we are introduced to one of John's favorite themes, which he's going to come back to again and again throughout his writing. And really only after we read the whole story... Will we understand the full impact of this verse? But notice three things about what John communicates here. First, there is an allusion to creation. The light shines in the darkness. That, after all, is what happened in the beginning. And John is saying the coming of Jesus into the world is like that. It's light coming into the darkness. It's New creation. It's the dawn of a new world. Regardless of whether you acknowledge Jesus or not, you are living in the world he made and seeing with the light he gives. He is the light of men. Even if those men and women don't acknowledge him. Second, there's a reference to Revelation. Jesus, the word of God, enlightens us, right? On our own, we are mired in darkness. We're like blind people, unable to to see God clearly and unable to know the world truly. And Jesus, John says, is the light shining in the darkness, revealing God to us. It's no accident, by the way, that one of the key miracles, one of the key signs in the Gospel of John, which we'll get to, is the healing of a man born blind. John does not include that just because it's a neat story about something Jesus did. He includes that because it fits with the theme that he wants to communicate, which is you are blind and you need to see. You're in the dark and you need light. And Jesus is light. The light shines in the darkness. And notice third, there's a, there's a moral component to what John is saying here. Later on in chapter 3, he's going to say the light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. See, darkness and light are not neutral. Jesus has come to shine light into the dark places of our lives. And to invite us to repentance and freedom. And each one of us is going to have to choose. Do we want the light? 
Or do we want to stay in darkness? John is up front about the fact that Jesus is light, and what that means is encountering Jesus is going to be a little bit uncomfortable because the light is going to shine into all the places in your life where you wish it wouldn't. But that's who Jesus is, and that's what Jesus does. You should believe in Jesus because he is the light. Verse 6, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. As I've talked about before, uh, I've taken up cycling in a more significant way these past couple of years, and that means I've spent about $6 million to buy all the clothes and accessories and gear because that's what we do, right? It's what you do when you take up a new thing is you got to pay the barrier of entry to get all the stuff that you need. And here's what I've noticed. Almost every piece of cycling gear is made with reflective material. And the reason is obvious, right? Because when you're riding on a city street early in the morning, you want what you're wearing to bear witness. You want the headlights of oncoming cars to be reflected in a way that gets people's attention and announces your presence. When John says there was a man sent from God whose name was John, he's talking not about himself, but about John the Baptist, the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ, the last of the prophets of the Old Testament. John the Baptist is like a reflector. He was not the light. He came to bear witness about the light. John the Baptist is significant. He's mentioned in all four Gospels as the forerunner, the sort of one who introduces us to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason is because there's a transition in Jesus between sort of the prophetic ministry of the Old Testament and the coming of a new era and a new age of God's grace and goodness. And so John the Baptist sort of stands on the threshold between the Old Testament and the New as sort of the one who captures and gathers up all the prophetic imagery of the Old Testament and that kind of ministry and then transfers it, points us to the Lord Jesus. And we'll see more of how he does that in the weeks to come. And so as we read this gospel for us living today, John the Baptist is a great character example. Because like him, our mission is to allow our lives to reflect the light of Jesus Christ. You are not the light. You are here to bear witness about the light. As we finish this point, notice how John describes Jesus in verse 9. This is significant. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. Notice in verse 4, he said, the life was the light of men. In verse 9, he says, the light which gives light to everyone. This is who Jesus is. Listen again to Leslie Newbegin. He writes, Jesus is the true light which shines on every human being. There is no other light. There are not different varieties of light. There's only one light, namely that which enables us to see things as they really are. And things really are as they are shown to be in the light of Jesus. Because he is the word through whom they all came to be. Thus it follows that when a person turns in faith to Jesus Christ, he meets not a stranger, but one whom he recognizes as the one in whom he was loved and chosen before the foundation of the world. Yeah, isn't that your story? When you met Jesus, you, you didn't know. He was the one you were looking for, and then you met him, recognized him, not as a stranger, but as the one who had loved you and pursued you before the foundation of the world, as the one by whose light you had seen everything you had seen. You should believe in Jesus, because he is the light. Third, you should believe in Jesus because of his glory. Look at verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is maybe the most powerful verse in all the Bible because it summarizes 
the most glorious doctrine in all of Christian theology, the doctrine of the Incarnation. The eternal word, the one who was in the beginning with God and who was God, became flesh and dwelt among us. The word glory is a word that means heaviness or weightiness or significance. Is there anything more weighty, more significant, more glorious than God becoming human? I mean, this is the event that has changed history. This is the radical new reality that upends everything. God has entered into time. The creator has stepped into his creation. The Lord of history has entered into history. You should believe in Jesus because of his glory, because the, of the weight and the significance of what it means that God has taken on flesh in the Lord Jesus Christ. This doctrine is at the heart of the Christian faith, and in fact, we might say we could start with the incarnation and just work out from there. And because this doctrine is so glorious and so sublime, let me borrow an illustration from St. Augustine to help us better understand the incarnation. What does it mean that the Word, the second person of the Trinity, became flesh? I want you to think in your mind of a word. Any word will do. Preferably not a swear word, though. Just pick a word. Make it a good word. Think of something beautiful and good. Right now, as you think of it, that word has a real existence in your mind, right? That word is present to you. You can think about the meaning of it. But now I want you to take that word that's in your mind and think about what changes when you speak that word. What happens is that word that was already present to you becomes a sound by means of air and vocal cords, but in becoming a sound, it does not cease to be a word. It's no less a word than when you were merely thinking of it, but it's now a word that has taken on sound. Augustine writes, just as our word becomes a sound and is not changed into a sound, so the word of God becomes flesh, but is not changed into flesh. For by assuming it, not by being consumed in it, this word of ours becomes a sound, and that word became flesh. Augustine is emphasizing that in the incarnation, the word became flesh, but not in a way that diminished what he was before. To say it another way, the incarnation is addition, not subtraction. The divine Logos, the eternal word of God, the second person of the Trinity, added to himself a human nature so that without losing what he was, he became what he was not. That's how the church fathers said it. This is a glorious thing. This is why Jesus is worthy of our worship and our awe and our respect and our admiration. Because Jesus is not merely a good moral teacher. Jesus is not merely an enlightened human being. Jesus is God in human flesh. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, this is the thing you should be dwelling on. The question you should be asking is, did what John is saying happen? Because here's what we know from history. History tells us Beyond question, there was a real historical figure named Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified by the Romans in about 30 AD. So the question you have to wrestle with is, was that person God in human flesh? Because John is telling you that's exactly what he was. And that's what Christians throughout history have believed. And if that is true, it changes everything. It means you have to rethink your entire existence. And that's why Christians worship Jesus and praise Jesus and follow Jesus because of the glory of the fact that in the Lord Jesus Christ, in this human person, Jesus of Nazareth, God himself was stepping into time, space, and history. You should believe in Jesus because he is life, because he is light, 
because of his glory. And finally, you should believe in Jesus because of his grace. Look at verse 16. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. The law of God given through Moses is probably one of the most important features of the Old Testament. And it was one kind of grace. The law was God condescending to us and meeting us in our need for instruction and for wisdom and for a way of life. The law is God showing us how to live. The law is God laying out the path that leads to blessing and joy and flourishing. And so John wants us to remember the law is a gift of God's grace. But how much greater is the gift of the incarnation? How much more grace is God coming to live among us? How much more of God's fullness do we receive through the person of Jesus Christ? The Old Testament anticipates and foreshadows and points to the coming of a Savior. And then we turn the page to the New Testament and read the Gospels and find not only that this Savior has come, but that he is the very Son of God, the Word made flesh, that God didn't send someone else on an errand. God came himself and took on flesh in order to set us free from sin. And friends, this is grace upon grace. Now, there still are sects of people in our day, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, for instance, who deny that Jesus is fully God. They revere Jesus, they honor Jesus in some way, but they do not believe that he is fully God. And verse 18 is one of the most important verses in the Bible for countering that error. Look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God, it says. Even Moses did not see God face to face. He saw God's glory as it passed by. So if no one has ever seen God, how can we know God? John says, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Notice what this verse tells us. Number one, that there's only one God. And Jesus is that God, and yet he is also at the Father's side. So Jesus is God, and yet there's a distinction between the person of the Son and the person of the Father. This is classic Trinitarian theology as concisely as you will find it in the Bible. Now go back to verses 9 through 13, and let's see the invitation of grace that Jesus makes. You should believe in Jesus because of his grace. Look at this invitation that he makes. Verse 9, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. So the true light, the Lord Jesus Christ, has come into the world that he made, and yet the world did not know him. And even his own people, speaking of the Jewish people who were alive in Jesus' day, who had the prophets and the law, and who knew to expect a Messiah, a Messianic figure to come, even they did not receive him. Verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Notice the gracious invitation we find here. First, the verse says, to all who did receive him. To all. Christ's invitation is indiscriminate. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from, what your cultural or social background is, you are invited to receive him. Everyone, everywhere is invited into this new people that God is forming in Jesus. This invitation is for you, whoever you are and wherever you are. 
Second, notice that it says, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name. John is going to have much more to say about receiving and believing. Both ideas are important. You must believe in his name. First, in other words, you, you must decide that these things John is saying about Jesus are true. You must believe, and you must also receive him. Think of the way we talk about receiving a guest into your home, or how a president receives a foreign diplomat. The idea is you must welcome him in. Christianity is not merely about believing the right set of doctrines. It's about welcoming the person of Jesus into your life, giving him access to every part of your being, trusting him fully and completely. And it's important that we hear that because we live in a very intellectual world where when he, we hear the word believe, we think data, facts, agree with some ideas. John is saying no less than that, but much more than that. He's saying, yes, you absolutely must believe that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, that Jesus Christ is God, but you must also welcome him in, receive him. Notice third, To those who did this, he gave the right to become children of God. Jesus invites you to become part of a new family, to receive a new name and a new identity. God wants you in his family. Jesus wants to give you a new name. This isn't some surface level Change. This isn't adding some new religious practices onto your already existing life. This is a radical break with the past. This is the invitation to find a whole new identity, to be defined by a whole different story, to be brought into a whole different family. This is the gracious invitation Jesus makes to all, to all who will receive him and believe in his name. Now, the prologue to the Gospel of John, the part we just looked at, was probably written last. It's likely that John wrote all the rest of the Gospel and then said, how do I write an amazing intro to this thing? And he just sat down and wrote those 18 verses. So, it is not surprising that over and over again as we go through this gospel, you're going to come back to these themes of life and light and glory and grace. In fact, the reason I've made these the four points of the sermon is because if you understand these four concepts, you will understand most of John's writing. John is devoted to these themes, that Jesus is life, that Jesus is the light shining in the darkness, that Jesus is full of glory, and that in Jesus we see and experience most deeply the grace of God. You should believe in Jesus, John says, because he is light, because he is life, because of his glory, and because of his grace. So friends, this is the invitation of the gospel. These are the things we'll be coming back to over and over again. And, and so that means two things for you this morning. Number one, some of you were invited to step into this, to receive this, to believe this for the first time. One of the amazing things, one of the fun things about preaching the gospel of John is that, I mean, I don't have the stats, but it's quite possibly the book, more than any other book in the New Testament, that has brought people to faith in Jesus. St. Augustine got saved reading the gospel of John. And you'll read story after story of Christians throughout history who picked up the Bible, began reading the gospel of John, and said, if this is true, I've got to change everything. So that's the invitation for you is some of you come to Jesus for the first time, become a Christian, step into this new life, receive this new identity. And for many of you, this is going to be an opportunity for renewal because you've already come to Jesus. You've believed in him. You've received him. And yet the reality is that as we live life, right, we tend to dull our hearts to these truths. Other things become more pressing and more significant. And John wants to bring us back and say, hey, do you remember the gospel? Remember who Jesus is? You remember where life is found? Remember what it was like when you lived in darkness before the light broke in? 
Do you remember the grace and the glory of Jesus? Don't let that become old news. Let it be fresh news. Let it be good news. So here are some questions that John, in this prologue, puts before us. Where are you looking for life? Where is the darkness in your life? What do you find weighty or significant or important? Where are you trying to find a name? Where are you trying to gain identity? Life, light, glory, grace, all of these things are in Jesus. And John invites you today to turn from wherever you're seeking to find them and to come or to come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's close in prayer. Jesus, we acknowledge, even as we have talked about these verses, that we are far from having exhausted their depth. What it means that the Word, who was with God and was God, became flesh and dwelt among us is at the heart of the deepest theology and the best hymnody and the richest writing that has come down to us through the centuries. These are things that are deep and sublime and weighty. So we would ask you this morning, number one, that we would not treat them like they are trite and simple, but also that we would not complicate them in ways we don't need to. Bring us back to the fact and to the truth this morning that Jesus is life, that Jesus is light, that in Jesus is glory, and that in him is the fullness of grace. Refresh our hearts with these truths. Awaken our affections to these realities. Bring back a harvest of obedience and joy in our lives. Meet us where we need to encounter you, and renew us with this good news, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. We're invited now to come to the Lord's table to renew our trust, our hope, and our groundedness and rootedness in faith and union with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let all sinners who are grieved and humbled by their sin, let all the weak who need their faith to be strengthened, let all who love the triune God and wish to love him more, Come now to the table of the Lord. The scriptures tell us that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and said to his disciples, this is my body which is given for you. Likewise, he took a cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Drink of it, all of you, in remembrance of me. And so we come now to commune with him. All those who come to the Lord's table should come in humility and in self-examination. These are holy things for a holy people. So those among us who have not yet come to Jesus in faith and in baptism should not partake, but instead use this opportunity for prayer and for reflection. And if there are any here who are under the discipline of the church or who are unwilling to repent of sin, let them be warned of God's judgment on hypocrisy. But for all present who humbly hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, be assured that your sins, your vices, should not keep you from this table. Christ welcomes every one of his people to come and find strength and healing in him. So as we continue in our worship, we're going to invite you to make your way forward to one of these four tables that you see at the front of the room. We'll ask you to come out the left side of where you're seated and come forward. And near that table, there'll be a server with bread. They'll tear off a piece of that bread and place it in your hands, and then you can take a cup of wine or of juice and make your way back to your seat and partake there. There'll be a fifth set of servers in the back that have gluten-free bread if you need that. And we'll work from the front to the back of the room to kind of keep it orderly. We invite you to come as you're ready 
be strengthened and renewed by the grace of God in Christ. Come now to the Lord's table as you're ready.
received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Part of the reality of the Christian faith is that we are a family, and in the same way that a father uh, during a meal with his children might facilitate conversation between, between him and the children, and maybe between others in the family, that kind of conversation is just a normal part of what it means to be a Christian. And what I'm describing, of course, is just the act of praying with other people. And it's for that reason that we make it a practice to pray with each other. We've got leaders at the front here. If, if you'd like to pray with someone, just come forward, sit in one of these front, uh, one of the seats in these front, these, this front row, and we'd be happy to, to pray with you. In fact, that verse I just quoted was instrumental in bringing me to faith. The idea that believing and receiving God, not my own performance, is how I'm accepted into his grace. And perhaps God is doing a work in your own heart where you either are believing that maybe in a new way or maybe you want to believe that in a new way and you need someone to help you get there. You're one of the folks that we'd love to pray with. So I would welcome you forward and anyone else who would like the prayers of the church. Now, as you go from here, do not go alone. Go with the Trinity with this blessing. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit abide and remain with us now and throughout all our time on earth until the day of his return. Go in peace.